I share my screen. Jane, you want me to start with the interpretation? I think so. If if Jovi's just about ready to pull those up, if you have the information, you can start without the slide. It's about ready. Sorry, it's just double sharing my screen okay. here. It's a bit fun, but we'll get there. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. And do we see two different slides? And give me a moment. It is going to go to um, presentation view. Just bear with me. Can everyone see that? There's one see. slide. Okay. Thank you. I think you could probably share, start sharing. Hello, everyone. We just wanted to remind you that we will be providing interpretation. So we're asking you when you choose the Spanish language to please keep the original audio interpretation off. The presentation is being interpreted simultaneously. So you're going to go to the bottom of the screen and you're going to notice the globe or the three dots and you're going to click on that and then select your language. And you need to do that for English or Spanish. Everyone needs to pick a language. Thank you. So the entren tienen la opción de elegir su lenguaje. I'm y ustedes pueden escoger recording. entre inglés y en español. Okay. Van a ver la parte de abajo de su pantalla, unos puntitos o un globo. Y luego ustedes le van a dar clic y van a elegir su lenguaje. Cuando elijan su lenguaje, tienen que asegurar que el audio original de interpretación tiene que estar apagado o desactivado. Muchas gracias. Hey, Jovi. Yeah. It takes a minute. Mm -hmm. So welcome everyone. We're here today to talk about discipline and we have some guests, but first we're gonna tell you a little bit about the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center for those of you who are not familiar. We are Connecticut's Parent Training and Information Center under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. We are a statewide, which means we're everywhere in Connecticut. We're nonprofit and we really focus on special education issues and serving families. All of our program staff are either individuals with disabilities themselves or parents of children with disabilities as well. We work with, these are our partners and our funders, the Down Syndrome Association of Connecticut, the US Department of Education, um, Connecticut Office of Early Childhood through the birth to three support, um, and the State Department of Education uh, specifically with the Bureau of Special Education, but we have some folks from different departments today. And then CPAC is also part of the Connecticut Family Engagement Center called the um, Connecticut Family School Partnership. Uh, and that you'll see is in the bottom left. And so anybody interested in family engagement information, please feel free to reach out for a minute. Estamos pidiendo a las personas que si hablan en español que por favor pongan su nombre en la sección de comentarios para nosotros entonces. Cuando... From the Center for Children's Advocacy, who are here to talk to us about discipline, law, and advocacy for students with disabilities, we did have session one in February, and this is the second of a three-part series. The third um, and the section will be on April 6th at the same time. And um, before I introduce our speakers, I would like to ask folks to hold your questions to the end. Uh, we hope to have time, but in the absence of time, we will try to get all questions answered by the third session. And um, if you are a family member or an individual with specific concerns about a specific child, we would like to ask folks to reach out to CPAC at any time with personal questions. And to, if you do have questions for today's meeting, to keep them focused on, as a group 
uh, learning experience rather than work on individual students. But we would have to be happy to process with anyone anything that they've learned that they have questions about after the meeting. Thank you and welcome to Marisa and Amy. Thank you, Jane, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Marisa Holm. I'm an attorney and the director of, of our Youth Justice Project at the Center for Children's Advocacy. Amy and I are really appreciative for the opportunity to be here and to partner with CPAC in this really important presentation around the law for students with disabilities and discipline, um, and look forward to today's presentation, Amy. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again just for joining us here today. My name is Amy Saji, and I am the Educational Success Project Staff Attorney here at CCA. I'm primarily based out of our Bridgeport office and also have representation out of Hartford as well. And my work really focuses on representing students with disabilities and helping families navigate the special education process. I know it takes a minute for the slides to move when there's two so, of them. I, I could not hear Amy. Did everybody hear Amy? Yes, I heard, I heard Amy. I okay. In order to hear Amy, I had to unmute original. <clears throat> oh, okay. okay. So let me do that right now so that the issue with the slides can be avoided. You had to unmute original, you said? Under the language. Yeah, because I couldn't hear her in the English channel. And I can't even see my globe. Maybe it's because I'm sharing. Bear with Maybe. me. Maybe. I'm going to pause share while I find a globe here somewhere. Or under the more. Um, okay, let me do this. I don't have a globe at all. Do you have English or Spanish? So you see the three little dots. Sometimes yeah. you may not see the globe, but you'll see the three dots and then you'll see the word interpretation and it'll allow you to switch to the languages. Okay. And unmute original? Yes. Okay, done. Thank you. Of course. Okay, so Jovi, when you get the slides up, Amy and Marisa are ready to start. Sure. And do you guys see both screens again? Yeah. 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 Okay. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Center for Children's Advocacy, we are an independent nonprofit law firm that provides legal representation, direct representation to youth and young adults in Connecticut. We have offices in Hartford, Bridgeport, and New Haven. And the areas we provide representation in include uh, abuse and neglect, racial justice, immigration, and across all the projects where we do work, um, we provide representation in education. So the main topics we're gonna cover today, we'll go over school discipline, the special education process for students with disabilities, and we'll also walk through some case examples and hypos to go over some best practices. As Jane mentioned, this, this uh, particular training is part two in a part three series. And the first series went through a bunch of, uh, put, put forth by our partners at SDE, went through a bunch of key um, factors and data on discipline. So to recap from some of the key points made in that last training, some of the things that we know about school discipline are that students who experience school discipline um, are going to become disengaged. They're going to drop out. They're going to, in many cases, get involved in the justice system. Uh, this is based on national data. It's, it's no secret. So one of the key points that we're 
aiming to get across today is to rethink using discipline if you do not have to. So as you learned about in part one of the webinar series, discipline in Connecticut is disproportionate, and the data shows us that exclusionary discipline is predominantly affecting students of color and students with disabilities at higher rates than their white peer counterparts. So for these marginalized students, they're twice as likely or more to be disciplined. One of the other key points that came up in the uh, data presentation that was put forth in the first uh, part of the series was the fact that exclusionary discipline related to threatening and confrontational behavior is way up um, post pandemic incidents of both per personally threatening behavior as well as verbal and, and physical confrontational behavior are up. Um, not in any way to minimize threatening behaviors, um, but those are also behaviors that are not necessarily mandatory under discipline law to require some sort of exclusion. Um, so one of the points we want to try to bring home through this presentation that we're doing is, are there if students are engaging in these sorts of behaviors, which many times happen on social media, are there alternatives that we can engage in rather than just moving to out of school suspension or expulsion? So the State Department of Education here in Connecticut has newly published parent guides to help guide families in understanding what their rights are when their student is being disciplined or might even be facing expulsion. So we're gonna have those guides added to the chat so you can keep them as a resource. So just to go over some of the basic definitions, a classroom removal in Connecticut is when a student is excluded for no more than 90 minutes. So anytime a student is removed from the class for more than 90 minutes, that, that is going to be amounting to an in-school suspension. When it is gonna be, 10 days or more out of school and you're not allowed on school grounds, that's considered the out of school suspension. So in school is when they're still allowed within the building and they might be separated. They might be going to an office area and they might not be in their direct classroom, but out of school suspension is when the student is being removed from any school privileges and off the grounds and they're going to be out of the school building itself. An expulsion is different because this is when you're saying that the student is no longer able to return to the school and this is going to be when it's 10 days or more, but there's a limitation here where it can't be more than one calendar year. So really, um, when it comes to the 90 minutes, that's the crux on when it starts looking as more of an in-school suspension versus a classroom removal would be less than 90 minutes. So what are the grounds for expulsion here in Connecticut? And as we just heard Amy recap, right, an expulsion is any sort of exclusion from school that occurs over 10 days by definition. And also this over 10 day time period is really important in special education law, which we're gonna get into later because anything over 10 days is considered a change in placement um, for special education programming purposes. So, what are the offenses that are considered mandatory are which and, and what mandatory means is that if there's reason to believe a student engaged in this offense, uh, then expulsion proceedings must occur. So the mandatory offenses include possession of a deadly weapon on school grounds or at a school sponsored activity, possession of a firearm on or off school grounds um, and sale or distribution of what's considered a controlled substance under the state criminal law on or off school grounds. Now, these mandatory scenarios um, apply differently depending upon the age of the student. If we're talking about a gun or a deadly weapon, that applies to students of any age, but the sale of the controlled substance is just for students above grade three. All other offenses that potentially would lead to an expulsion are discretionary in, in nature and should only apply to students in grade three and up. So that's any violation of school policy, which also would endanger a person or property on school grounds, 
or something that's seriously disruptive of the educational process. So as you can see, these are kind of gray terms um, and different types of conduct could be lumped into either scenario. Sorry about that, I was <laughs> muted myself there. Um, so most discipline in the state of Connecticut is actually con is considered discretionary. Schools have a lot of authority when it comes to administering discipline. That catch-all that we just talked about on the previous slide, seriously disruptive of the educational process, is you know, often the grounds that's utilized to um, suspend or expel students. It gets tricky because it, it can include off, um, off school ground conduct. A lot of this in this day and age, especially post pandemic, includes activity or information that's being shared on social, social media. Um, sometimes this is conduct that's happening at a school sponsored activity off site. Um, and sometimes it's, it's activity that's happening in the community that maybe involves students from school. Um, you know, again, what we're trying to highlight here is that in many cases, the administrator or the decision maker has discretion as to, um, as to whether or not to administer discipline and anything that might qualify as discipline should be clearly outlined in the particular school's code of conduct. So who are our students with disabilities? So these are the students that are falling below grade level. They're the ones that are at risk of being considered truant, and they're the students that are receiving these multiple disciplinary referrals. So it's important to keep in mind that many students with disabilities can meet the criteria for either Section 504 accommodations or special education. Amy, can you tell me uh, what is the difference between a 504 and special education? Definitely. So if we go to the next slide, um, we do have a chart here just to go over. So with Section 504, it's more about um, accommodation. So if a student has an accommodation where they might need extra time on tests, Section 504 is really covering the ability to help them have those accommodations so that they can access our education. When it comes to special education, the main difference here is there's a difference in how the student is able to access that material and if there's an adverse impact. So special education is more about the impact on education and how that student accesses that material where they might need something more than just accommodations. They might need the curriculum modified versus section 504. It's looking more ac across the board of accommodations and special education is all about the individualized instruction that's tailored to that student's needs. And there's a lot of different procedural safeguards that come with special education. So with special education, you have to qualify under one of the 13 categories. It's about the learning that's happening in school, whereas Section 504 has more to do with reasonable accommodations for a medical diagnosis. I think we can go to the next slide here. Yep, sorry. Amy, did you wanna go ahead? Yep, so just to go over section 504 a little bit more, um, in order to start the process to be identified for a section 504 plan, families would first need to have a medical diagnosis or documentation from an outside medical provider, such as a primary care doctor. So the parents can then provide the school with that documentation and request that the school schedules a 504 meeting with the school section 504 coordinator. So after this process occurs and within 45 school days, the family will then meet with the school team to review that medical documentation and along with hearing the parents' concerns in order to see if that student might be eligible for this 504 plan. And if so, the team together can work on drafting it. So this plan will look like a series of accommodations that the student might receive and who would be responsible parties in order to make sure that student receives those accommodations. But really the main difference here is that you really wanna have that 
medical diagnosis where a parent can bring that documentation in and really get the ball rolling with the school in order to have that 504 plan developed together. So here we have a case example. Amanda, she's a sixth grade student. She has a medical diagnosis of ADHD and she's having difficulty concentrating in class. And she's having trouble in a lot of her different academic classes and she's starting to fail exams and tests due to just not having enough time. So is Amanda a candidate for 504 here? So when looking at this, the first step that you would really wanna consider is um, does the family have the medical diagnosis that they can provide? So Amanda here seems to have um, an outside doctor with the diagnosis of ADHD. So that would be one of the first steps that they could do to start seeing if Amanda is eligible for 504. And so they would bring that to the school and be able to request those the meeting to occur within that 45 day school period. Uh, Amy, it's Leona again, sorry. Um, I just had a question. If uh, found out that a 504 is appropriate versus an IEP for Amanda, does that mean that she's no longer eligible for an IEP in the future? Yeah, so that's a great question because a lot of times this is where confusion can happen. So if Amanda here is eligible for a 504, that does not mean she can't have an IEP later. So you want to have the 504 to see if the accommodations are working and she's having access to education. And so if for some reason the accommodations, say Amanda gets extra time on these tests, is not working and she really needs more of that specialized time to really understand the material. Maybe it's not just the time on the test. The 504 has provided those accommodations. It's not working. Amanda's still really struggling with the material and needs that content modified, then you can put in a referral for special education and really say, there's something more that's going on here. 504 has provided accommodations. It's not working for her and she really needs that greater level of support. So you can always look at having an IEP and a special ed referral after. So it does not preclude you from ha having a special education IEP down the road. Thank you. Now, what if there was no documented diagnosis, but she's still struggling? So in these situations, we would actually recommend a referral for special education first, because then you can meet with the school team, you can share your concerns, and this will also prompt your right to having comprehensive evaluations. So while the school is going through the special education process and conducting evaluations, the parent could then simultaneously reach out to their primary care doctor or another provider and try and get that medical diagnosis simultaneously. We just wouldn't um, want it to preclude them from starting the special education process. So if you don't have that medical documentation first, ask for the special education referral first because the school can do that because when it comes to the IEP and special education, you don't need the medical diagnosis. The IEP serves as more of an educational diagnosis versus you can have the medical um, diagnosis with the outside provider happening simultaneously. But this way you're assessing the student's needs, you're getting that evaluation process going. And then if you're coming to the PPT table and you're realizing maybe the student doesn't need special education or they're not eligible, you would have that um, medical documentation where you can then refer it to a 504 and really that way you're saving time because all it's all about what the student needs and you're trying to have a sense of urgency around it because you don't want to delay. So we would definitely recommend starting with the special education process first. Thank you very much. I, I have just another one, but I know that we have to slow down just a little bit for the interpreters too. So um, Whose obligation is it for child find? And do the parents have a role in that? Yes, that's a great question. So child find is the obligation that really rests with the state delegated to the individual school district to make sure that students, um, students suspected of having a disability are identified, located, and evaluated. And that, so that obligation initially rests with the, with the school district where that child may be found. And, um, but there are situations where, you know, perhaps a referral isn't happening. And as we know, parents know their child best. There are situations where a child, um, or excuse me, a parent may be the one that should be initiating the referral and has to get the child find process started. 
in which case our office would recommend that they do so in writing, requesting a PPT-1 and an evaluation. But ultimately, that obligation does rest with the school district. And here in the state of Connecticut, there's regulations that specifically point to students experiencing truancy, discipline, or lack of academic success uh, as grounds for a referral to a PPT to get that evaluation and special education referral process started. Thank you. So here we just have a visual roadmap um, of how you get identified for special education. So you really, there's three main buckets. You start with the referral process and then you go into developing the IEP. And the last part of the process is really implementation. So that's taking all those pieces together, figuring out what the child needs, how you can write that on the IEP in order to make sure that they get the support that they need. And then you're making sure that you're implementing that within the classroom or within the, that child's plan to make sure that they're getting everything that they need and that they can actually make meaningful progress. So these are some examples of typical initial evaluations. It's important that a parent shares any and all concerns of any suspected disability with the school team because evaluations can be considered and conducted in all areas of a disability. So if a parent only tells the school that they're concerned about their child's reading ability, for example, but leaves out the fact that that student is also struggling with sensory deficits, the school might not do uh, an OT or an occupational therapy evaluation to focus on the sensory deficits and might only focus on doing an academic achievement because that's the main concern that was raised at that PPT. So it's really important to have good communication when you're at that PPT table and you're listing all of the areas of concern that you have regarding your child so that the school is well informed and that you can sit down with the PPT team together and making sure that all the areas that you have a concern about are getting an evaluation so that you're really testing for all aspects and you're really looking at the whole student and not just one aspect of what they might be struggling with in school. So Amy, it's Leona. And I was just curious, uh, what category does a student with behavioral challenges fall under? Definitely. So students that have behavioral challenges, and we can go to the next slide for this, there's 13 different categories and disability categories that a student can fall under for special education. But for a student with behavioral challenges, you're most likely going to fall under other health impairment slash ADHD, how it's written on the Connecticut IEP or emotional disability. But the key component here, no matter what category you're so you identify with for eligibility for special education is less important than the services you're receiving. So the door to special education is order to make sure that you're qualifying under one of the 13 categories. But the key is to make sure the services are dictated by the student's needs and that a certain category doesn't prevent you from getting a certain service. So it's always more important to know that the IEP is comprehensive and that it's tailored to your needs and that you're not getting certain you're not getting certain services based on your eligibility category. So a student that has behavioral challenges, maybe they're falling under emotional disability on the IEP. But that doesn't mean that they can't also be getting reading support if they're struggling with their reading ability. So that would be one of the key components to making sure that when you're getting qualified, you're not limiting your services based on that qualification. And the other components of qualifying for special education also includes that the diagnosis itself doesn't mean that you qualify. So you have to show the adverse educational impact, and you also have to show that you, as the student, need specialized instruction. So this specialized instruction can be designed to address social, behavioral, and academic needs, but all of those things together really help you become identified for special education. Uh, thank you for that explanation. Um, can you share why having a student identified for special education is beneficial for students with behavioral challenges? Sure, Leona. Um, so the short of it is students who are receiving special education, right, have this very important document called an IEP. 
which has very detailed goals and objectives and interventions in it. And it's essentially a contract between the school and the student. And so if you have an IEP, a student must be receiving a free and appropriate education of faith. They must be receiving that in the LRE, the least restrictive environment. And that's true, especially if their behavior is impeding their learning. Um, and also they're gonna be protected from a change in placement that, um, that push out from school that includes 10 days or more. You can go to the next slide. So students who, have, who are in need of behavioral supports, any student with a disability that's having behavioral challenges in school, this is irregardless of their um, disability category. If they're identified as, as, as special education, they have an IEP and they have behavioral issues that are impacting them in school, then their IEP must address their behavior. And this can happen in a variety of different ways. There could be targeted goals and objectives. Um, and also there should be in many cases, what's called a BIP, a behavioral intervention plan, which is informed by a type of assessment called a functional behavior assessment in FBA. Um, so all of those pieces are things that should be considered for a child with a disability who has an IEP and is having behaviors that are impacting them in school. Hey, Marie, so this is Tom at <clears throat> Kosker. Um, I have a quick question. I know last summer um, there was some guidance that the feds put out around, you know, treatment and in, in, in of students with disabilities and specifically around behaviors, behavior students with behavior challenges. Um, I, I think I recall that correctly. Can you can you speak to that and in how that guidance fits in here? Absolutely. Thank you, Tom. Um, so there were actually three different documents that were issued last summer by the US Department of Education, Office of Special Education Service and Rehabilitation Services. That's a mouthful there. But there were three different documents. The first one, which um, they're all linked here, and I know they'll be provided in the chat as well, was a dear colleague letter, which talks about the importance of IDA's discipline provision and also cautions uh, states and districts about the disproportionality that's been occurring in discipline. It highlights some of the data showing that nationwide, you know, students with disabilities as well as students of color are being disproportionately disciplined and reminds of the protections that are out there to prevent that from happening. Then there's a very comprehensive Q&A document, which uh, is very helpful and user-friendly and goes through um, the specific law around discipline and how it applies to students with disabilities who are receiving special education or perhaps should be receiving special education. Um, and then finally, there's a document um, called Positive and Proactive Approaches to Supporting Children with Disabilities, which is more of a guide for stakeholders and schools that has a lot of really good resources in it about interventions to utilize, encouraging um, different restorative practices, and also contains some good information about developing uh, behavior intervention plans and comprehensive functional behavior assessments. Thank you. So the guidances that Marisa just touched on also go over the MDR a little bit. So an MDR is a manifestation determination review. And this is typically a PPT in Connecticut, and it's a protection that students with disabilities are entitled to if they are receiving 10 or more days of discipline. This PPT has to occur before a student can be considered for a potential expulsion referral, and the student's family is entitled to notice as well as receiving their procedural safeguards ahead of this meeting. The MDR can be discipline that's 10 days in a row, and a lot of times this will look like a 10-day out-of-school suspension, or it can be for 10 days or more in a pattern or a practice. Like if a student has received 20 days of OSS, but it's been scattered throughout the semester. So the parent and school team here will convene a PPT and they'll go over the incident for which the student is suspended for. And then there will be a two part inquiry that the team has to consider. Um, if we go to the next slide, we have a flow chart here that 
really goes over the two-part inquiry. So there's two questions or two prongs that the MDR is made up of. The first question is, was the conduct or incident that the student is being suspended for a manifestation of their disability? So what that really means is that, is the incident related to their disability? And if the answer to that question is yes, then the student must be returned to school. And this is a protection for students so that they are not wrongfully discriminated against based on their disability. So if the disability connects to the incident at hand, they would not be able to move forward with an expulsion referral or anything. They would have to be returned to school. And so question two is a little bit different and it focuses on what is the conduct or is the conduct a failure of the school to fulfill obligations under the IEP? And this is different because it means, is there something that the school team or that the parents at this PPT can point to that the school hasn't been complying with in regards to the IEP? So this could be a question regarding, has the services been getting implemented? Are there anything that's on the IEP, like having an annual review? Is there something missing that the school has failed to be in compliance with according to that student's IEP. And if there's something that you can point to on this prong, then if the answer is yes, the student again must be returned to school. So here it's important to highlight that this is a two-step inquiry. And what this also means is that you only need to have an, a yes to one of these questions in order for that student to be returned to school. So only if both of these questions, if you go through both of these questions and the answer to both is no, only then may a, a school consider that student for potentially um, an expulsion referral. But again, this is still will be based on what the offense is and if it's mandatory and discretionary, but you have to be able to answer no to both of these questions in order to move forward with the possible expulsion. And here, a lot of times in these PPTs, there might be a disagreement. There might be some parents and some school representatives in that PPT meeting disagreeing with each other, and there's no unilateral decision here. So if there's a disagreement between the school and the parent regarding these two questions, the parties then have options for a dispute resolution, and we'll dive into that a little bit more later. But some of the options here could be filing for due process, or maybe they're going to mediation. Amy, I have a quick question on that, if you don't mind. <clears throat> um, or Marissa, whoever can answer. My experience with this is that oftentimes, well, oftentimes the parents are in the dark, which is why we're doing this training, of course, but parents are in the dark and aren't even aware of this process. Um, the school is on, under some obligation, I'm sure, to inform the parent of this process, right? So a PPT is called, students been out for a number of days, um, and they're doing this manifestation um, determination review. My experience is that the school says, makes that determination, not really as a team. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's a team decision, right? That's what the law says. That's what we talk about. But in reality, the parent just goes, okay, they told me it's not a, it's not a manifestation of their disability. So it's not. So, and they just accept it, right? Because they don't even understand, first of all, what the heck manifestation, the whole thing's all about, right? The parents are very much in the dark on this oftentimes. Um, so I don't know. I, I mean, it's not really a question. It's just kind of a comment. Like it's just that's my experience as an advocate of working with parents and working with families is that they're not <clears throat> really in the loop on this. And I, I guess I guess I'm raising it to to also to the parents and educators whoever's on this call to to really bring the parents in the loop on that. Or if you're the parent, really ask to be brought in the loop on that. So I don't know if you can comment on that, but it's just that's my experience. Definitely. No, I'm really glad you brought that up, Tom, because this is something that the MDR is not like a typical PPT. As a parent, you're immediately going to go to these PPTs and it's a really counterintuitive process because as the parent, if your child does something that is putting them in this position, you might feel that you want to support your child and say that they're taking accountability. You might want to apologize and you might not want to be defensive versus with how the MDR is structured. It's so counterintuitive where really what the parent should be focusing on is how is the incident connected to that disability? Because maybe that student got into a fight, but maybe that fight is also based on something that's related to their disability. Say they have ADHD and they are hyperactive and impulsive. And so you really wanna be able to emphasize the fight is connected to that disability. 
based on prong one. And that's something that can be really counterintuitive for parents to understand because they might want to go in and say, he didn't mean to get into the fight, that he thought about this, he's reflective and he wants to apologize. And that's all great because that's important for accountability and things like that. But when it comes to the special education and the priority here with looking at what is the next step the school has to take, you really want to lay out all the facts for the school. You want to show um, the school all the ways that this is connected to a disability. And you might do that by having outside providers come in. So if your student might see a therapist outside of school to go over some of their impulsivity or go over some of their behavioral challenges, this is the PPT that you want to bring as much support as you can because it's important for the school here to look at the whole student and not just what's on the IEP. Because a lot of times students are facing things that are happening in school and they're facing things that are happening outside of school. But when it comes to the MDR, you really want the school team to see that not only is the IEP something you take into consideration, you want to look at the whole student and see what's in the whole education file. So this is really important for students that might have multiple disabilities, but their IEP might only say one thing or you only get one checkbox with a category. So it's important that you let the school team know everything that's going on here, how it's connected, and really look at prong two as well, because sometimes there might be something as simple as maybe that student got into a fight um, with another student because they were supposed to be in social work service at that time, but maybe their social worker with all the staff shortages going on, there's just no social worker in that school. So that's another reason to connect to the MDR that is really something that you really want to lay out and it can be difficult for any parent or even advocate to really navigate this process. And that's why we wanted to really break it down into these two buckets where it's counterintuitive. So if you go to an MDR, it's important to realize how this is, uh, it's more important than even any other PPT because this is the last step of protection for students that have special education, whereas a general education student would not have an MDR. You would have uh, this is for special education students. So this is right before an expulsion referral can happen. So this is something that it's not talked about enough. And we really want the parents on this call to remember how important that if you get an MDR or a PPT notice about this, you want to reach out to CPAC or CCA right away, because this is something that is not an easy process to navigate. And we want to be able to help people understand the um, just the severity of significance this has. Thank you, Amy. And, and just not to dwell on this, because I know we have a lot to cover, but, you know, there's also, and I've had these experiences where students are very suggestible, right, based on their disability, very suggestible, and they're doing behaviors and they're doing things because, you know, a student talked them into it, and then they do something um, that could get them, you know, suspended. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, I think there's lots of reasons, right, that, that it, it might be a manifestation of their disability. The, um, the other thing I want to say is, so really the manifestation hearing is they can be suspended for multiple days, you know, five up to 10 days without a manifestation. But is it if it goes over the 10 or is it only if you're considering expulsion? Like, is it just at that point of, hey, we're thinking about expelling this student, they're over the 10 days, then you have that MDR? Or so it's based at what point? Is, yeah, thank you. Thank you. You understand my question. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to jump here. So by law, the MDR is required at the 10 days which is when the cha change in placement technically occurs. Now that 10 days could be cumulative or it could be a pattern. So there could have been previous three days here, four days there, same behavior. Technically, if a student is um, you know, be being considered for discipline less than 10 days, the school can do it. But there's also no reason that an MDR can't happen and the guidance addresses this. Um, before that 10 day time frame, because that is best practice. If a student's behavior is impacting them in school, the PPT should convene to discuss what the interventions are and come, come together to try to uh, make sure that that doesn't continue to happen for the student. Awesome, thank you, thank you. And that's, that's again, best practice, not my experience as an advocate that they don't happen until after 10 days until we really have to happen. But, but again, to the parents and stuff on the call, if your student has that fourth and fifth day, you can certainly say, hey, what's up? Like, should we be talking about this? So anyway, thank you. Sorry, can move on. <laughs> So just to go over this a little bit um, quickly, just to keep an eye on time, the IEP, if a student has behavioral challenges, 
In general, you want to make sure that the IEP addresses these behaviors, and the guidance goes into this a little bit deeper, but you can look at how you can have targeted supports, such as student has behavioral challenges, you want to have a functional behavior assessment conducted, and you want to have a behavior intervention plan. And typically, if a student is going through the MDR process, if they're returned to school, um, that also triggers having an FBA conducted, and if they already have an FBA, it's important for the IEP team to really look through and make updates in order to address that behavior as they move along. Now, here's a case discussion of a student, a hypothetical student. We're going to call him Tyler. He's a seventh grade student who's, um, who's identified for special ed here. We're not indicating the eligibility category. Um, and he's been walking out of history class. This has been going on for a little bit. He's been getting into some verbal fights in his English class. On the day of his history exam, he has a sub. Now the sub, this has happened to many a time, right? Teacher is not aware that Tyler actually is entitled to be in a separate room for his exam. And he gets stuck in that regular ed classroom. Well, he gets upset, he insults the sub, he throws his notebook, refuses to take the test. Hypothetical question here that I'm gonna answer. Can the school suspend him? Um, I mean, as we were kind of talking about and as Tom brought out, I mean, hypothetically they can if it's less than 10 days, but what should they be doing in this situation? If this is behavior that's been happening time and time again, seems like there's a pattern here, the PPT should be convening to discuss what are the behavioral interventions that are in place? Has a behavior intervention plan been developed? Um, has a, is a functional behavior assessment, a comprehensive one warranted in this case? Those are, that's what we would recommend in this particular situation that Tyler be given a PPT uh, that would look at behavioral interventions that would help uh, minimize this behavior rather than put him out of school. Another alternative that Connecticut law favors would be in-school suspension. If there's really got to be a suspension, potentially consider an in-school suspension where the student can continue to have access to whatever services they're entitled to under their IEP. And, and just to jump on that again, Marissa, sorry to jump in, but, you know, thinking about oftentimes those um, interventions aren't in place, right? So oftentimes those behaviors are happening, there's no plan, there's been no assessment. Oftentimes, this is what I see as an advocate, right? And, and we'll see students who are, are being suspended, whether it's in school or out of school for multiple days or short days or whatever, but they, they don't have that plan in place. So I'm glad you brought that up because they, they, the assessment hasn't been done. Um, and, and I see students that are in uh, uh, you know, outplaced out of district even, right? And in schools that are designed to uh, help students with behavior challenges. And yet they're in these schools without a behavior plan, without an assessment being done and then being disciplined for behaviors that may be a manifestation. And whether or not they're manifestation, you still have a plan in place, right, for, for those students. So I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Is there, is there an opportunity, is there a chance um, that students, if it is connected, if it's still connected to their disability, right? They do an MDR and they say, the student, this, this behavior was connected to their disability. Can they still be removed from school? Yes, Tom, um, they can. Unfortunately, there's three, um, there's three particular circumstances. They're called special circumstances or in some cases, emergency exceptions. And we can, we can go to the next slide. And so just for uh, just to remind folks to have a slow pace for the interpreters. So a change in placement could occur. And again, I just want to clarify the manifestation determination review is required when a student is suggested of being put out of school for more than 10 days. So that 10 day mark is the trigger. Um, so when, in what circumstances could a student um, engage in a behavior that is a manifestation of their disability? 
but still experience a removal from school. If they bring a weapon, if they possess or distribute an illegal substance, or if they inflict seriously bo serious bodily injury on somebody else <clears throat> at school. And in this case, students may be removed to what's referred to as an interim alternative educational setting, alternative setting. We don't really use this acronym very much, but <clears throat> it's what's written in the law. Those are the circumstances in which perhaps the behavior was a manifestation, but because of the safety concerns that the behavior um, brings to light, the student could be removed to this interim setting for up to 45 days. And now this must be, and the determination of this setting must come through and be agreed upon by the PPT. And again, this, so this must be a placement that's agreed upon by the PPT. The guidance really addresses that this placement has to give the student an opportunity to participate in the gen ed curriculum and still make progress towards their goals and objectives. So even though the student may be in a different building, they need to have access to FAPE. And what if they don't agree? What if a parent doesn't agree with that decision? And this is where, as Amy was referring to earlier, some of the dispute resolution methods come into play. And this is really where special education law is stronger than 504. Under special education law, there's an opportunity to pursue voluntary mediation, in which case both the parent and the district have to agree. And then a state mediator, somebody impartial, is appointed to try to help resolve the dispute. <clears throat> they could, a parent could also file for due process in which a hearing officer would be appointed to listen to evidence. And in these particular situations, it's actually called, it's an expedited hearing process that has to be expedited in 20 days. <clears throat> in another avenue is the, the parent could file a state complaint. And I know the parent's guide for special education was, was shared out before the complaint form and the ability to have a state investigator appointed um, is another way to resolve a dispute. And generally, in these cases, the students remaining in an alternative setting pending that dispute, the result of that uh, resolution process. Marissa and Amy, I'm going to give you the it's 129, just so you have a sense of where you are. Great. Thank you, Jane. Uh, so just to go over quickly another case example, this is Erica. She's a ninth grade student that has special education under OHI ADHD. She's also an English language learner. She's feeling that she's bullied on the bus and her mom has reported to the school that about these concerns, but she's just not sure if her concerns have got, gotten to the right person based on the language barriers. And Erica has brought a taser onto the bus and that's discovered when she enters school. Here, it's just really important to connect that Erica bringing the taser on the bus is related to the ongoing concern. So if you're having a manifestation, you would really wanna bring out that point a lot more because if the ongoing bullying wasn't going on, she might not have felt the need to bring the taser on the bus based on impulsivity. She was feeling worried about her safety. So in general, a lot of this together, you really want to look at the whole student again. So if there's this ongoing bullying concern, she's not feeling safe. And part of her disability is related to impulsivity and being in um, hyperactivity. This is an example of where you can connect those two together in order to bring that out in the MDR. And if the school and parent, again, still disagree on the reasoning here, then you would want to pursue those dispute resolution options, such as filing for due process or trying to have a mediation. And if, if she gets expelled, let's say she gets expelled in this case, Amy, what's the obligation of the school on their end? Definitely. So 
For students that are expelled, if they're a student that has special education, they're still entitled to FAPE. And FAPE is the free and appropriate public education that all students with disabilities and special education are entitled to. So this is regardless of their age or offense. And this is something that's different from general education students because uh, students have special education, they're not only entitled to FAPE, but their decisions have to be made by their PPT team. So if that student um, in the last example is expelled, they still are entitled to receive their services in this alternative setting, or they could have a change of placement. And this is something where it becomes a negotiating point, because if that school uses a specific expulsion referral program where their students that have expelled uh, been expelled to go to this alternate setting. If that setting doesn't meet the needs of this child that has special education, this could be where the team could try to work it out together with the parent, trying to find a change of placement so that student could still have their IEP goals and objectives met, but they might be in a different setting. And sometimes this happens in lieu of an expulsion where you work together to find the right placement for that child in order to address the behavior concerns as well. So this is just an important point because students that have special education that are expelled, they're still entitled to receive all their IEP accommodations and services. Is Marisa still on there? Somebody got dropped, so I'm wondering if it was Marisa. Yeah, I think Marisa, I, <laughs> I don't think you're on the call right now. I think it's time to go to breakouts. If I don't know if you want to finish or, oh, here she's back. Somewhere. She's connecting to audio. I don't think she was able to. Oh, no. Marisa, are you back? Hi there. I'm not sure what happened. Just got kicked off. But um, very quickly, it sounds like we're at this at this slide. Um, the protections for students not identified for special education. Um, these protections are extended in three particular circumstances where um, a parent has previously expressed concern in writing that their child might need services, where they've requested that their child be evaluated or that somebody in the school suggested that the child be evaluated. That's the harder part to find out unless for some reason it's in the school record. But in these cases, if it can be shown that um, this happened prior to, um, prior to the discipline incident, all of the discipline protections and the special education process would kick in for that student. Okay, so it's time for breakouts. And just a few things before we go to breakout, I am going to set everyone into a breakout room. So give me a few while that happens. But um, everyone's going to receive a different hypothetical. And you're going to discuss that hypothetical, you will receive a five minute war warning, and a two minute warning, and then the system would automatically give you a 60 second warning as well. Upon returning, to the breakout um, room when you're coming back to the main room, there's gonna give you an option to leave room or leave the meeting. So I only mention it because it's easy to pick leave the meeting and it won't bring you back to the main room. But no worries, if you get kicked off, we can bring you right back in, so that's not a problem. Um, but just be, you know, just notice that if you wanna leave the room, not the meeting. So I will stop sharing while I set up the rooms Just making some adjustments here. Putting everyone in their right rooms. And I know that Gio put in the chat if anybody needed interpretation. I just wanna make sure one more time before I set up everybody's room that those who need interpretation receive um, that accommodation. So if you do need interpretation, please let me know, put it in the chat 
Otherwise, you may be in a room um, that there's no interpretation. So please. And I'm working on that and just give me just a few here. While she's working on that, um, just to let you know at the end, we will launch a poll um, that we just ask you to do. It's three quick questions and it just helps us know how we did and how we can improve um, moving forward. So thank you. And it'll just take me just a minute or so. If everyone is back, you have to choose your language at the bottom again, coming back from a breakout room. And Keo, if you can tell folks that in Spanish, I'd appreciate it. I don't see Keo though. She's I coming. Don't. She's got to be zapped back. Oh, okay. She. Jovi, are you able to tell folks just to choose the yep. language in Spanish? Yep. Para toda persona que necesita el uso del intérprete, como estábamos en una sala de reunión separada, ahora es regresar a la, a la sala principal, se requiere que elijan el idioma de nuevo. So, por favor, abajo tienen que elegir su idioma. Si necesitan intérprete, tienen que coger el, el inglés. Y toda otra persona tiene que escoger, el, um, perdóname, si necesita intérprete, necesitas escoger español. Okay, so are we ready to debrief on our breakout sessions? Yes. Marisa yes. and Amy, and let's remember for interpretation sake to go slow. Thank you, Jane. Sure, Amy, why don't you start? Definitely. So my group focused on hypo two, which was Jason, and really they hit a lot of the main points, right? So Jason had a 10 day suspension, but an expulsion was scheduled. So no MDR took place. So that's really the first step when it came to this hypo that you really wanted to make sure Jason got that MDR in order to make sure that that procedural safeguard is in place. And another point that my group also hit is looking at what type of expulsion would be required here. So this was an example that included a discretionary expulsion. So here, you wouldn't have to even go through, if the school chose to, if the MDR did not go the student's way, it would still be a discretionary expulsion where this is where you can bring in some of the guidances that we talked about earlier and look at some restorative practices. Because in this example, there was some peer related conflict. This situation could involve other students. So returning that student might not be enough just to return them back into classroom and act like nothing happened. You really want to have that restorative approach that's really addressed within this hypo. And another really great point that um, a group member brought up is there's a question here as to what the school actually knows, right? So the school knows that this is a student that has a specific learning disability, and that's a category on their IEP but it sounds like the school might not know that the student also has undiagnosed uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, and that in the education files or the medical records the school has, it does talk about ADHD, but the school might not be aware of the student's past history and trauma. And so there's a question as to, can this be brought up at the MDR? And so our answer is absolutely, because you want to make sure the school in front of you at this MDR is looking at the whole student. So again, we talked about the category on the IEP is not the only thing that's about the student. At the MDR, you want to bring up every possible uh, information that maybe the school isn't aware of because the school can't make an informed decision at this MDR and the parent can't make an informed decision at this MDR unless you have the full context of who that student is. So that peer related trauma and that PTSD can be related to the incident that occurred because there was an ongoing issue of bullying. And while we didn't get into it in this uh, the series of the webinar, there is uh, some bullying concerns and there are Title IX obligations and just responses to how you how a school should respond to bullying concerns. So all of those factors taken together could also bring you to look at the second prong of MDR and whether or not the school really addressed those concerns. But 
Um, the last point that my group really made that was great is making sure that, that families understand what a functional behavior assessment is, because there's a lot of stigma about doing evaluations on student. So making sure that you understand that these evaluations are not in a way to target students or harm them, but really to identify what are their triggers, what are the behaviors that are manifesting in school, and how can the school team use a FBA in order to make sure that students' IEP is tailored to their needs. So my group really hit a lot of great points. So just wanted to debrief a little bit on that. Thanks, Amy. We had, an, we had a hypo about a second grader who had engaged in some uh, violent behavior and was a special education student who'd experienced a transition. And our discussions were similar. And we, we hit upon the age of this student and how the law really prohibits suspension, uh, except in very rare circumstances of or violent or sexual behavior. But we talked about the importance of taking a step back and looking at what is going on with this student in the moment and the team convening to talk about that and put supports in place rather than just put the student out, which is going to reinforce the behavior. And again, we appreciate this opportunity to um, share this training with you. Um, really would appreciate everybody completing the poll at the end. And I know that Jane has some closing remarks. Thank you, everybody. Thanks to CCA, Amy and Marisa for your presentation today. Kim, I don't know if you want to show uh, if you're still here, but Kim Traverso is one of our other partners who did the first series um, back in February. And Marisa and Kim and myself will be back in April. Hopefully we can answer any unanswered questions that we haven't gotten to yet. Um, and any of you who are family or staff that if you have individual questions about an individual child, please do not hesitate to reach out to CPAC. Um, thanks, Tiffany. She gave, gives you guys big marks. And um, we hope to see you on April 6th, same time, same channel. Let your friends know. And this will be posted on YouTube. So that will be available. Give us a few days to edit and then it will be up. Thank you, everybody. Hi, Kim. So Kim Hi. and I back in April and hopefully a lot of the ladies from CPAC. And we'll see you guys then. Sounds great. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Good job, Jovi. Yeah. Okay. Everybody left me. I thought we were going to be free. What the heck? Bye, yes. Alba. Consider yourself lucky. We'll <laughs> Bye. Next time. Bye. Bye.